Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Howes-Whitecross, and I'd like to welcome all of our viewers tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live this evening. If you'd like to communicate with us tonight, please use the Zoom chat room and remember to select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone listening to be able to see your message. Please ask your questions to our speaker this evening using the Q&A box on Zoom. But if you're watching through Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for both your comments and questions, and Vernon will answer these at the end of the webinar. Let us know you're tuning in on all major social media feeds by using the hashtag Conservation Conversations. If you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can catch up with these recordings on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel or listen via our new podcast available on all major streaming services. We'd really like to encourage all of you listening to please visit our YouTube channel and click that subscribe button. It helps us grow support for our webinar content and we look forward to gaining many more subscribers as we move forward into the new year. Now I'd like to say a big thank you to those of you who continue to generously support these webinars. You've helped us through the Quicket Donations platform. All that you've done is simply scan that QR code and you've also been able to visit the Conservation Conversations webpage where the donations link can be found. Every single one of these contributions, no matter how big or small, is helping us to keep these talks free for all to learn and enjoy. So thank you to all of you out there who have made the effort to help support us with this content. Now, BirdLife South Africa is excited to announce that we've got several vacancies open at the moment. If you're looking to recruit an assistant bookkeeper, two interns, or for our conservation division, as well as an assistant for the Ingula project, you can find out more about these positions by visiting the BirdLife South Africa website and clicking on the vacancies tab. The deadlines are approaching soon, so please be sure to head over to that website and check out the adverts as soon as you can. Now, November is Birding Big Day month, which means that we will be having an exciting competition towards the end of the year. You can head over to the BirdLife South Africa website to register your open or community team. And you can also email any queries to Ernst Retiff on bbd at birdlife.org.za. Birding Big Day is not just a competition, but a day where we celebrate the wonderful bird diversity we have in our country. And those of you who listened to Trevor's talk a couple of weeks ago will know just how incredibly impressive the bird diversity in South Africa is. You can compete if you want to, but teams can also just spend a few hours in their local parks or nature reserves, logging the birds that they encounter on the Bird Lassa app and enjoying being out in nature. As a collective, let's see how many of South Africa's birds we can log together. Last year, we managed to record 667 of South Africa's 850 odd species. So let's see if we can get up to 850 in 2020. Be sure to play your part and join BirdLife South Africa and Bird Lassa on this year's Birding Big Day. We've also partnered with Eco Training to bring birders a very special opportunity as part of the Birding Big Day celebrations later this month. We're offering a long weekend of birding in the magical Makuleke concession from 26 to 29 November. This area is in the extreme north of Kruger National Park and is one of South Africa's best birding hotspots with a long list of specials such as the racket-tailed roller, Pearl's fishing owl, Arno's chat, two different species of spine tail and many other special birds found only in that top part of South Africa. For just 5,400 Rand per person sharing, you'll receive three nights of accommodation, including all food, guided drives and walks. All you need to do is get yourselves there. This really is an incredible offer, but spaces are limited to 20 participants. And I think we've gone over half of the capacity already. So make sure to book as soon as you can by emailing inquiries at ecotraining.co.za. And if you have any further questions, you are welcome to contact our AV Tourism Project Manager and co-host of Conservation Conversations, Andrew de Block. BirdLife South Africa looks forward to welcoming you to the Makaleke region soon. Now, BirdLife South Africa is a membership-based organization. We pride ourselves on having over 40 affiliated bird clubs that support our work across the country. If you're looking to expand your birding horizons or wanting to find fellow birders to explore the fascinating world of birding, we recommend visiting BirdLife South Africa's website and clicking the Support Us tab, where you'll find the link to join a bird club. 
You can find a suitable club near you and enjoy all of the exciting social activities that are on offer from our bird clubs. And we'd highly recommend having a look at the many different bird clubs that are out there that will suit your various needs. Now, our final Jakarta Media Monthly giveaway for November promises this month's winner an amazing collection of bird-related titles. And I see one of Vernon's books is actually up for grabs this evening with our Jakarta Media competition. I can highly, highly recommend these titles to all of you. And we're very grateful to Jakarta for supporting our webinar viewers with these amazing prizes every month. Be sure to head over to the Conservation Conversations website page, look for that competition section and click on the enter button. Unfortunately, this is only open to South African based viewers, but we really do hope that all of you will head over there and try your luck. You'd never know, you just might walk away with an early Christmas present. Next week, we also celebrate the final Zeiss Hygiene Hamper giveaway, where one lucky viewer tuned into the webinar series will walk away with this fantastic prize. So make sure to, to make sure to tune in next week and we will do a lucky draw of our viewers and announce the winner in our final webinar series on the 24th of November. But it gives me great pleasure tonight to welcome world famous and best selling author Vernon Head to Conservation Conversations this evening. For many years, Vernon has shared his literary skills with us through his elegantly narrated stories, deeply inspiring poetry and tales of hope. Vernon's book, The Search for the Rarest Bird in the World, was long listed for the Sunday, Sunday Times Alan Payton Literature Prize, as well as the Barry Ronger Fiction Prize. Vernon's work has also been recognized by the National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences, where he was shortlisted for the 2020 Fiction Prize. Vernon's unique way of describing the world in a most beautiful and insightful, insightful language has gained him a spot on the best-selling authors list. Vernon is also an architect and passionate bird watcher having traveled many miles across the world to see some of the most inspiring and beautiful birds that are on offer. Vernon is also currently an active member on the BirdLife South Africa board and is a former chairman of this committee. Vernon, you are a great supporter and friend of our organization. We look forward to having you on our show this evening and hearing about your incredible journey into linking your literary and burning, birding passions. Vernon, over to you. You may request control of the screen now and take it okay. away. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, I'm just going to click a few buttons and we should there be we good go. to go. There we go. Thank you. Over to you, Vernon. Hello, everyone. Um, this evening, I would like to invite you on an expedition in search of the rarest bird in the world. And as it is with, with all expeditions, I suppose we must allow ourselves moments to wander off the track and perhaps ask questions about nature and uh, maybe ask questions about bird watching and, and, and why this fantastic pursuit has, has offered itself to us and, and what it means in this troubled world that we live in. And so bear with me as we do that and unpack bird watching as I see it um, while we are on this journey of discovery to find the rarest of the rare. And uh, it reminds me of some wise words said by the great Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega Gasset when he said, we are called upon to unfold the wings of life to the utmost. And I guess tonight's talk is going to be about a celebration of wings and what wings mean in our, our modern age. And on that theme, I'd like us to hopefully get to the next slide and talk about spiders. Now, spiders, um, or large group of spiders, in fact, are possibly the greatest aviators in the natural world. And when Charles Darwin stood on the deck of the HMS Beagle many, many years ago, and he looked up into the rigging, he was hundreds of nautical miles off the coast of South America, and he saw spiders descending from the sky. But what was even more remarkable for Charles Darwin when he gazed upon these little creatures was not their descending, but their lifting up again off the decks and off the rigging as they fashioned wings of silk. Now we've come to 
unpack and understand that uh, many spiders practice this technique of ballooning where they have these strands of silk that create these plumes that lift them up and take them on their journeys of discovery across the world. But perhaps we should remember that bird watching is sometimes not about birds at all. Perhaps bird watching is about looking at the big things and the small things and everything in between. And I'm going to take you on a journey this evening to the northeast corner of Africa, to the Horn of Africa, in fact, to Ethiopia, to where I went on an expedition with three other friends of mine about 12 years ago in search of the rarest bird in the world. And, you know, what amazes me about bird watching is once you look at the little things and you look at the big things and the things in between, one gets swept up into this dance of nature. And you look at the mountains and you see them becoming coming the valleys. And you look at the valleys, you see them becoming the rivers and the rivers becoming the sea. And, and you start to read the landscape almost like a book. And by doing that, you're able to look for the birds and find the birds and understand the sort of wonderful world of, of bird watching. And perhaps when Charles Darwin was looking at those tiny spiders, it was preparing him for asking bigger questions about the natural world. But in Ethiopia, when we landed there all those years ago, one doesn't quite appreciate that the country is sort of bisected by this East African rift that is constantly splitting apart. And it's been doing that for almost 25 million years at a rate of six or seven millimeters a year. And as I stood in the middle of the rift down in the south of Ethiopia, because that's where we found ourselves after we'd hired a tiny little rusty four by four, and after we'd gone on our long journey, we found ourselves down in the rift in the south of Ethiopia. And as I stood under a tree, and looked at these volcanoes and this dynamic landscape, I was reminded that in 10 million years time, I'd be standing at the bottom of a new ocean, a long thin ocean that would divide Africa right in this place. And in many ways, that is bird watching. It's about time. It's about geological time. It's about the formation of soils. It's about why trees grow where they grow and why birds sit where they sit. And it's about circadian time. It's about day and night and summer and winter and all those wonderful rhythms that make up this hobby of bird watching. So here is Ethiopia and one can see the rugged geomorphology of the landscape. You see that red square in the middle, which is Addis Ababa, and that's where we landed. And then you kind of get a sense of this long thin valley that's going virtually from north east to southwest. And if you look carefully, you see it's littered with little blue dots. Those are the Rift Valley lakes. And we were to make ourselves a journey down to the bottom two lakes, Lake Abaya and Lake Chamo. For that was where we'd been given a map. And in this aerial photograph, you're, you're able to see these two lakes and immediately it jumps out at you that one is a sort of pinky brown and the other is bright blue. And immediately that tells you a story, of course, of the biodiversity that will occur in both of those lakes. And they're both teeming with crocodiles and some of the biggest hippopotami in the world. But uh, both lakes have hardly been explored and new species are being discovered there all the time. But our um, destination was to move between those two lake, lakes across this thin isthmus of land from left to right to a place called the Nechisar National Park, which you see there is a green dot. And to give you an idea of scale, the Lake Abaya, which is the Brown Lake, is 1,162 square kilometers, the biggest Rift Valley Lake in Ethiopia. And the lake below it, Lake Chamo, is 317 square kilometers. They're not very deep, seven or eight meters, 12 meters at the most, but teeming with life. And we found ourselves there. And we found ourselves there because we were on a quest. 
we'd been given a map because in 1990, a team from Cambridge had gone to the Nechisar Plain and they'd arrived there and it's possibly one of the most remote plains in Africa, hardly ever explored by the West. On the expedition, they collected 23 species of small mammals, including a rodent and a bat. 315 species of birds were seen, 69 species of butterflies and 20 species of dragonflies and damselflies were identified. 17 reptile species were recorded, three frog species were filed, plants were listed, many drawings were done. And on one evening, in the middle of the night, there was no wind, there was a heavy insect load in the sky, it was hot, and they were wandering down a smuggler's track on the Nechisar Plain, and they found a wing. And the wing was squashed and dried into a, the muddy track. And one of the gentlemen picked it up, a few feathers blew away. And that wing was popped into a brown paper bag. And over the years, it, it made its way back to England, to the British Museum at Tring. Uh, studies were done by the top ornithologists in the field of night jars. And in 1995, on page 302 of Ibis, a new species of bird was described to science, the Nechisar nightjar, Caprimulgus solala, solos meaning only, ala meaning wing. And it, it became a mythical bird in, 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 many, in many senses because it's the only bird ever described to science that nobody had ever seen. And the only bird ever described to science that was described by just one wing. So when I used to open my sub-Saharan field guide back then um, and go to the nightjar page, you'd see on the image here, down in the bottom right-hand corner, number five, Nechisar nightjar. There's just a drawing of a single wing. And Having, having looked at this, this plate for many years and then having got a phone call from Ian Sinclair one day saying, do you want to go and see if we can find the bird that might be attached to this wing? As you can imagine, it was an exciting moment for a young birder like me and, uh, and off I went and I'm gonna take you on this journey tonight. But when I was on the plains of Nechisar, in that pristine wilderness with those white grasses, and incidentally, the white grass is called Nechisar. It's the Amharic word for white grass. I was standing under a acacia tree, and I couldn't help but think about Woolworths and Quickshop and Cell C and ATMs. And I couldn't help think about Cape Town and fast cars and freeways and the fast life I left behind and how peaceful it was in Nechisar and how remote it was and how privileged I was to be a bird watcher. And what an aspirational world I had left behind in the cities that I came from and, and how I used to go into these quick shops and quick stops and woolly shops and buy these wonderful dinners that you can put in the microwave in five minutes and then eat while you watch TV and probably shower at the same time as you talk to friends on social media on your iPhones and iPads. And I thought of all of that. And I thought of how people want to live in bigger houses and people next door and how they want to drive faster and more flashy cars and look at the clothes other people are wearing. And I thought of this aspirational troubled world we live in while I was on those plains in Echisar. And then I remembered the inspirational world, the inspirational world we should be striving for and teaching our children about, the inspirational world of bird watching, and what that means today, what that means every day and what it should mean. And I'm privileged to live in Cape Town where my backyard is the Atlantic Ocean. And 
I wanted to find a special image to capture inspiration. So I got hold of Albert Froneman, who I regard as one of a Africa's greatest bird photographers. And I said, Albert, can you give me your most inspirational bird photograph? And he sent me this. And he sent me this where the bird is tiny and delicate and elegant in the spray of this rising swell, but it's at home in nature. It's at home in this expanse of wilderness right at my doorstep in Cape Town. And it talks of really the fundamental message that bird watching gives. The message of inspiration, that when you look at a bird, you see everything else, you see the landscape. And whether you're in Cape Town or privileged to be on the plains of Nechisa in southern Ethiopia, where hardly ever a Western expedition has ever set foot, you're able to remember what's important. And how many of us have had the privilege of going to places like the Kruger National Park and seeing this sort of inspiration? This is another one of Albert's photographs, and it's his, his favorite bird photograph of a lilac breasted roller, the dance of color in the sky. And what does that tell us about the privilege of seeing differently? What does that tell us about rareness and commonness and the beauty of nature? And what can we teach our children? So let me tell you the story of a young man who followed a journey of being inspired by nature because it's relevant to Africa and it's relevant to seeing and it's relevant to bird watching and it's relevant to rareness. This young man, it's a picture of John Paul, James Paul Chapin. He's 19 years old here. He's about to set, set out on an expedition to the Congo in 1909, a guest of the ornithologist Herbert Lang. And this young man was inspired to watch birds because he used to watch mice play in his backyard. And the mice led him to the woods and the woods led him to the birds. And then he found himself invited on this expedition because he spent time in the museum in New York. And this man was to find the rarest feather the world had ever known. And as we are sticking with the theme of wings, I thought the theme of the rarest feather appropriate. And what happened on this expedition, which went from 2000 or 1909 to uh, another six years, 1915, 1916, in the heart of the, the Congo basin, Chapin was sitting on a chair. He'd, he'd separated from Lang for a while and there were on separate expeditions collecting all kinds of, of avifauna and, and, and other, other species and uh, other, other animals and creatures and plants. And he spotted a feather in the headdress of one of the, the tribesmen. And he asked if he could have that feather because he couldn't identify it to any of the, the birds they'd collected. And the expedition came to an end and he found himself back in New York, and then he found himself at the Museum of Terfuren in Belgium, doing research on Congo species. And one early dawn, he walked into a storeroom, and in that storeroom, he saw some birds on a shelf that were stuffed and dusty. And in fact, they had been stuffed in there because they were thought to be common peafowl from the museum or the zoo down the road. But he took out that feather and he placed it on the wing of one of these birds. And what he discovered was a new species to science because the wing matched the secondary feather in that bird. And what he discovered was the Congo peacock. Possibly a discovery that equaled the discovery of the okapi in terms of West African species at the time, and a bird that set ornithology alight. And in a sense, you know, great rareness like that reminds us of, of wilderness and reminds us of, of, of what's out there to, to still discover, to still see. But it also reminds us of being at home and that we can discover and explore every day.
every morning, every dawn. We can discover when we walk from our front door to our car and just pause under a tree. We can discover in the park across the road because nature is everywhere. If you just care to look with the eyes of a bird watcher. And this of course is the olive thrush, a very common bird in suburbia in South Africa. And another photograph by my friend, Albert Froneman. He wondered why I asked for an olive thrush, but it's because I just want to read this very brief poem called The Olive Thrush. The dark of the thrush begins music held in dew and joy. Grass glitters of the moon things, a hop, a flit, seep light. Daytime on the thrush in the way that butterflies are noon, and then the suburb shouts. And the olive thrush, oh dear, the olive thrush reminds us that there are other birds in suburbia just as beautiful. And if you'd, if you'd asked me what my favorite bird in South Africa was, and I'd entered Trevor's quiz a few weeks ago, I would have said this bird, the hardy dog. The sound of the hardy dar dawn is without question synonymous with dawn, synonymous with suburbia, and synonymous with wilderness. But I think back, and I certainly did think back when I was there in Nechita on those plains and standing looking out at distant mountains and standing with my friends, looking for a very rare bird, I did think back to the first bird I'd ever seen when I was five years old, almost 50 years ago. And I was holding my grandfather's hand in a place where Northcliffe is today. Northcliffe back then was a series of farms, and my grandfather had a flower farm, and it was dawn, and the sun was rising, and the mist was low over the felt, and we walked and we heard this call, do, 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 do. And he said, that's the sound of the rain bird. And we walked further in the list and the mist and the sounds of, of that part of the felt kept coming. And of course, eventually this bush wobbled in front of me and there was this beautiful bird with his bright red eyes that sat there and he said, now there it is. And I looked in my Robert's Field Guide when we got back to the farm, back to the farmhouse, and it was Birchall's Kukul. And it, it changed my life. And for 50 years, I've been, I've been looking at birds. And that thought of first hearing the sound of a bird, imagining what it looks like, and then seeing it will never leave me. And I hope that children will, will find that kind of magic in nature. I certainly did. And I, and I continue to do so. But there's one thing about bird watching and bird watchers that I, I constantly found wonderful is our love of maps. We seem to love books and we seem to love maps. And you'll go into any bird watcher's home and there'll be walls of books and there'll be maps. And those maps give us an opportunity to dream. They give us an opportunity to wonder and to imagine what's out there. And I particularly love maps of Africa. And I particularly love old maps of Africa because they have these open spaces, many of those spaces without names, these vast areas that haven't been explored by my eyes, certainly. They might have been explored by other eyes, by the eyes of people who, who, might, who might live there. But they allow, allow us to dream. And maps give us great security because they allow us to wonder. They also allow us to get lost here and there. And without maps, bird watchers would have lost something. They would have lost that wonderful opportunity to go into places they've never been. And on this particular adventure, we certainly did have a map. And here's the map of the Nechisar Plain. You can see Lake Abaya at the top and Lake Chama at the bottom. You can see this this bridge of land that links the two. And we wandered from the left across to the right. Um, it's called the, the bridge of God or the bridge of heaven. And to get onto this stretch of volcanic earth, you have to 
drive through the Pulfo River, which is in this riparian rainforest. And we drove up that riverbed, the butterflies lifting in their tens of thousands. And then we found ourselves on that bridge of heaven and finally on the Nechisar Plain. And we would spend a couple of days there in search of the Nechisar night jar. We had to hire a chap who had an AK-47 to keep an eye on us because it's a particularly dangerous part of the world. But we were there to look for the story of a wing. And we were there to look for what we regarded and what the world regarded as the rarest bird on earth. But why was it the rarest bird? There are so many rare birds. This species is called the black stilt. The Maori word is kaki. It's found in South Island, New Zealand. It used to occur across New Zealand. In the 1940s, there were over a thousand of these birds around. It's certainly probably the rarest wader species in the world. There are only 169 adults left. The species was on the brink of extinction in 1981 with only 23 adult birds in existence. But fantastic captive breeding programs have, have been successful in, in harnessing uh, juveniles that have been released back into the wild. But it's still under huge threat as many island species are. Um, it's under threat from hybridization from pied stilts, which occur in their tens of thousands in New Zealand. It's under threat because of hydroelectric power stations and agriculture and overpopulation and habitat destruction, words that we all are so familiar with. And it's a bird that is teetering on, on the edge of extinction. And it certainly is one of the rarest birds on the planet, but it's not the rarest of the rare. There's still 169 of them. So is this perhaps the rarest species of bird in the world? This is certainly the rarest parrot on the planet. It's called Spix's macaw. And in May in 1819, the Bavarian scientist Johann Baptiste Ritter von Spix shot a magnificent long-tailed blue parrot in the Kachinga, the dry thorny woodland in northeast Brazil. And uh, the bird was later to be given his name by other ornithologists. And von Spix described the bird as occurring in flocks back then along the banks of the huge Sao Francisco River. And he said that it was even back then a very rare bird. And it certainly was, but it was also a very beautiful bird. And it was a highly collectible species. And it was lusted after by people. And it was hunted down. And eventually it was stolen from the wild in totally, totally unsustainable numbers. And by 2001, only 180 years or so after its discovery, it was declared extinct in the wild. It's an appalling thing to say and an indictment on us as a species. Now, they say that 177 uh, of these birds exist in captivity. But that's another shocking story because, you know, one thinks back, not, it was not so many years ago that the, the bird was traded for 100,000 US dollars a bird, $200,000 a bird. And it reminds us of the illegal trafficking of rare and endangered species across the planet. I mean, we're talking 20 billion US dollars. That's what the trade of endangered species, the illicit trade is. And so this bird doesn't occur in the wild anymore. There are rumors. There was a rumor that perhaps a Spix's macaw was seen in 2016. There have been a few sightings before that, but it's been officially declared extinct in the wild. 
but it does exist in captivity. So it's not officially the rarest bird in the world. But perhaps this is. This is the mythical Berlo Berti Bubu that was first described or first seen in 1988 in Berlo Berti in Somalia in the grounds of a hospital. And uh, it was seen uh, every now and again over a period of weeks. And eventually it was captured because it was felt to be new to science. And uh, it was thought that perhaps it was the only, the only bird of its kind, a sort of a living type specimen. And so scientists didn't want to, to exterminate it and kill it. And it was, uh, it was taken actually back to Germany where DNA was taken, blood was taken, analyses were done. Um, and then it was returned back to Somalia. And because Berla Berti was so unstable, it couldn't be released back there, it was released in another area. And then it disappeared. But it was for a while regarded as the rarest bird in the world, one of a kind, never to be seen again until the genetic work revealed that in fact it was a morph of another species of boo-boo, the Somali boo-boo, and so was no longer regarded as the rarest of the rare. And then this species was felt to perhaps claim the title of the rarest that there ever could have been. And this is the white-chested tinkerbird, only one type specimen ever collected in 1964 in the Creptocephalum woodland of northeastern Zambia. And this is sort of an evergreen woodland that reaches into um, Angola. It's a very difficult part of the world to get to, and it's certainly a very thick and dense woodland, difficult to walk through. And I was privileged to actually go on an expedition to see if the bird existed about 10, 10 or 12 years ago. And we certainly couldn't find it, and it's, it's never been seen since. But at least it was seen once, and it, and it was collected, and here it is. And there's a, there's a whole bird, and it exists, and it has a name. And it has been regarded as possibly the rarest, and it still might be out there. New genetic work is, of course, now perhaps saying that it is a morph of, a, of another species of tinkerbird, and so is now not at the front of the queue of the rarest of the rare. And there is, as, uh, as recently as 2019, a new candidate, the Stressman's bristle front, a bird that was thought to be extinct in the Matica Atlantica rainforests along the coast of Brazil. And this species suddenly made an appearance after about 52 years and was discovered again a couple of years ago. And this photograph was taken in 2019 of a female. And I'm gonna play its call. The mournful call of the specimen's bristle front. But it was calling, and there was no other bristle front of its kind to hear its call, and it's felt it's the only, only bird of its kind left, although there might be a few hiding in the Mata Atlantica. And then we come to the Nechesar nightjar. And here is the actual wing that was found up on those plains all those years ago. It's a bird that uh, was only perhaps first seen by the local community and certainly not by Western science 
and described, as I said earlier, just by a wing. But a bird that up until our expedition had a name, but it had never been seen. And so was regarded as the rarest bird in the world. But with all rareness, it reminds us of the importance of the very common. And this is a photograph um, taken by Mariki Froneman, Albert's wife. And I particularly wanted to look at this bird because when we think of the very rare and the rarest of the rare, we must remember the importance of the very common. And rareness reminds us of that preciousness that commonness tells us about. And even with a bird like this, look how it dances in the sky. These are murmurations of common starlings in Europe. And they might be common, but they're indeed beautiful, inspiring, and precious. I'm just trying to move to the next slide. I'm ambitious with these multimedia things. So, as we found ourselves in Nechisa, we found ourselves as a team of four. Jerry Nichols in the middle, next to me, Ian Sinclair on the right, and Dennis Ware on the far left. We found ourselves up there on that plane with that map, as I said, and we had an X and we had a track that we knew had held the wing once. And because it was a night jar, we had our torches ready and we explored that area two nights in a row. And we were trying to create a list, a list of the rarest of the rare. And I thought I'd show you this image from my bedroom where I have another kind of list, a list I've kept for 26 years of all the birds I've seen from one window. I've seen 60 species from this window, all common birds, all the stories to tell, all the stories to tell of wilderness right outside, right in the middle of a city, but rareness was what we were after on that day. And we were on this plain in Nechisa, looking out over mountains that have never been explored, looking out across woodlands that have hardly ever been explored by science. And in front of you in the foreground, you can see the Nechisa plain, those white grasses. And we wandered, we wandered back and forth with our torches at night, looking for the Nechisa nightjar thinking about why we are bird watchers, wondering about what commonness is, wondering about what rareness means, wondering about the ambassadors of the pristine, which is often what birds are to me, and what this place might be one day, and what it means for us to look after such places and what conservation NGOs like BirdLife South Africa are trying to do across our country and across Africa looking after biodiversity, looking after nature, looking after wilderness so that we might appreciate where we belong and how we can learn. And this is looking from the plains back to Lake Abaya across those woodlands that we'd, we'd wandered through. And on the left, you can see that isthmus, that, that scattering of little volcanoes, some forming islands, some forming that track that we followed to get up onto this plain. And I looked at all of that and I thought about 50 years of bird watching and the privilege of looking for the rare and trying to unravel mysteries and thinking about that spider Darwin looked at and how it made wings of silk. And so I got back to Cape Town and wrote a book about it. And it's called The Search for the Rarest Bird in the World. Lots of people have read it all over. And it's really about all the things I've just discussed why I watch birds, 
what rareness means, what commonness means, what the conservation of birds mean to our everyday lives. And that trip to find the Nechisa Nightjar was in many ways an opportunity for me to find a new love, a love of words, a love of sentences, a chance to capture the story of birds. And I've continued writing and have, have found a fantastic way to talk to people that is beyond cell phones and iPhones and iPads. And I've started writing poems about birds. I'll read a brief two line poem. It's called Skywork. I watched the bird fly, and up there was the home of art. And that really is what bird watching is to me. It's about the combination of art and science. It's a combination about knowledge and hope, ignorance, bliss, understanding, naivety, aspiration and inspiration. And poetry helps me explore that. I've also had the privilege of becoming friends with some of the greatest bird watchers and ornithologists in Africa. And Jakana asked me to edit a collection of true stories in the search of birds. And this came out a few years ago and all the offerings, all the short stories, which are true stories are written by people such as David Allen and Mark Anderson, Mark Brown, Callan Cohen, who incidentally talks about his rediscovery of the Congo peacock, Susie Cunningham, Richard Dean, David Litswayo, Rob Little, John Matham, Peter Ryan, Peter Stain, Ross Wanless, Mel Tripp, and many others, all sharing moments where they connected with birds and nature. And I've specifically asked them to write a short story, a true story about a moment that reminded them about why they watch birds. And I urge you to go and buy this book, unashamedly rush out and buy hundreds and thousands of copies because all the money from this book is going to the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology so they can help unravel answers and questions about birds and how we belong in the same world as them. And I've just written a novel which has come out fairly recently. And the reason I chose a novel and, and not a nonfiction book was because how do you tell a story about the Congo River, the deepest river in the world, 120 meters deep in places, a river full of mystery and power, a river that separates countries. How do you tell the story of a river that I've traveled up and down a number of times? And then how do you tell the story of a tree? This is the Myobi tree. They grow up to 50 meters tall, you find one Mahobi tree in every 10 hectares of Congo forest. Uh, they're important to the local communities. From a cultural point of view, they give oils from the seeds. They are treasured. And they're scattered across the Congo basin. And they're in trouble. And I saw this tree. I sat in the shade of this tree. How do I tell a story about this tree and that river and this city? This is Brazzaville, the Congo River separating it from Kinshasa. And in a sense, it's one city just separated by a bit of water. It's one society, one language, just separated by an international boundary that was created by the West. It's a city with great poverty and great trouble. And yet it's a city about an incredible river with an incredible history and it's about special trees and it's about people. How do I tell a story about birds within that context? And so I, I wrote a novel and that novel tries to talk about the importance and the poisonousness of walls and how rivers can become walls in Africa. Yet they should not be walls, they should be linking things, things that link us and remind us of nature. And this is the book a tree for the birds, which talks about my love of birds and my love of trees and people and languages and cultures and tries to tell us how we should reimagine what walls mean in this world where people want to build walls, 
all the time. And right now where walls are beginning to crumble down with so much hope. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I briefly told you about my love of birds, the search for the rarest bird in the world. And by the way, whether we saw it or not, you're gonna have to buy the book and read it to find out. Please buy lots. But I really want to share with you one message and that is birds are a great connector between us and wilderness, between us and our friends, between our neighbors, across the other sides of walls, across neighborhoods, across cities and across countries. Birds are the great connectors between science and art. And there's this great contextual piece. And this is a wonderful conceptual art installation. And it's possibly one of my favorite conceptual pieces of art. It's done by Tim Knowles, the, the British artist in London. And what he did with this piece was he took an easel and he put a piece of paper on its surface and he put it in a quiet pond in a little park in London and he tied a pencil to the branches of the tree above it and he waited for the wind to blow and as the wind blew the tree sketched an image. Now what the artist is trying to tell us is not that trees are great artists but that nature and art are connected and that when the wind blows the tree speaks and it does so if you look at its branches and you listen to the birds and you look at the shadows and you look at the water below the trees in the parks and if you look at nature like bird watchers look at nature it might answer some of our questions about a poisonous world full of aspiration that needs to be a world of inspiration without walls thank you ladies and gentlemen Alyssa I don't know how I hand over to you but that's the end of my talk let me see if I can click all good, Vernon. Go. I'll take back control. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vernon. That really was a fantastic journey and so beautifully illustrated. We really do appreciate you coming onto the show and, and sharing your journey with us and those beautiful insights that you, you narrate so wonderfully. I unfortunately, I'm not gifted with the, your use of adjectives, but wonderful <laughs> to see your, your, your wonderful story come together there. And thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, before we, we move on into the question session, just a reminder to everybody, please, that um, we will be, you will see a little um, survey as you exit our webinar, and you can let us know what you thought of tonight's webinar. And there's a couple of other questions that you're welcome to fill in there. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Caroline Howes of Wits University's School of Animal, Plant and Environmental Sciences. She'll be coming to your screens to share some new and exciting research that's looking at access to birds and biodiversity across the city of Johannesburg. And I think Vernon's talk illustrated that so beautifully, looking at how we engage and access with um, nature around us. So Caroline's been testing whether the luxury effect is observed in many developed northern hemisphere cities and whether that holds here in the developing southern hemisphere. So she's got some really interesting insights and observations to share with us, looking at what birds can be found across one of South Africa's biggest cities. So be sure to tune in next week. Now, if you have any questions for our speaker tonight, you can type these into the Zoom Q&A box or the Facebook Live comment feed. And I see that we've got a couple of questions coming in here already. And uh, we've got one from Mark Vernon asking, what is the subject of your next book, please? If you're willing to share that with us. Yes, with pleasure. I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping the subject of my next book is about the ocean. It's about the sea. It's about what it means for us to live on the edge of the sea and how that boundary between land and sea might teach us so much. And I hope to tell the story partly through the eyes of a seagull. Fantastic. So well, we look forward to, to that next installment, <laughs> Ben. And I'm sure if your previous books are anything to go by, this one's going to be just as good. And we, we can't wait for that. Um, Should be ready next year. Brilliant. Can't wait. Um, we, we've got a question here from Judy asking if there's any chance of seeing the painting that the tree did, Ben. And I don't know if you'd know where whether the artist actually displayed that and people can Google it. 
I think I think the artist probably didn't. The whole idea about the piece was a conceptual piece about what it means to look at nature differently. And uh, although you might well find that the actual sketch the tree did has found its way into the Museum of Modern Art because it really was one of the most powerful conceptual pieces done for many decades. Absolutely. So Ben, and I know um, you went out in search of that, that rare bird and you, you haven't shared with us whether you did or didn't find it. Um, we've got an anonymous question here, just asking whether there was any plan to potentially try and collect another specimen while you guys were there, or was it more just to see the bird? The idea was to capture a specimen and take some blood and perhaps a strategically plucked feather, but that would be about it. Um, it's a, a difficult part of the world to, uh, due to red tape. So that was the extent of what we were gonna try and do from a scientific point of view. And we certainly fashioned all kinds of strange nets and uh, other equipment. But when you do read my book, you'll discover our, our levels of competency. Absolutely, thanks Vernon. Um, and we, we've got another comment. It's more of a comment than a question really, also from Anonymous. Um, talking to some of the specimens that you showed on, on the screen. And obviously we know um, historically ornithology um, was very much about uh, shooting specimens with a gun rather than a camera as we have moved on to, and thank goodness for that. Um, but obviously a lot of the, the specimens which you showed were collected way back in the day when um, shooting birds to, to bring them and study them back in the Western world was very much commonplace. Um, would you like Indeed. to just elaborate on that a little bit more and sort of how yes, science has I mean, moved it's, away from that question yeah, now? Absolutely. I mean, I, I didn't want to elaborate too much, for example, on the Chapin expedition, uh, because it would have sounded hor horrific to everybody. I mean, we're talking about tens of thousands of specimens that were, were shot um, across the board from mice and bats through to, to a whole lot of birds and not just one species, you know. Uh, 50, 50 of the same species of this and 60 of the same species of that. Um, but things have changed and the whole morality behind how science engages with naming and, 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 and the meaning of type specimens has obviously moved on greatly. So I don't think that really happens much anymore. Certainly, and the, the technology and the techniques that are available to us often means that we don't need to take a whole Indeed. specimen, which Indeed. is really great that we, we've moved on to that. Um, our CEO, Mark Anderson, and a good friend of yours, Vernon, is asking whether any DNA of the wing of the Nechisar nightjar that is sitting in the Tring Museum has been, has been examined to see if it's got any relatedness to other nightjars. Do you know it all, Vernon? Um, uh, it certainly has been studied, um, and it has no, no close relatives. Um, you know, what's interesting about this, this particular nightjar is... Um, our expedition um, was one thing. Uh, there was another expedition um, at a different time of the year, and they saw a completely different suite of nightjars to us, completely different. And, and the thought is that this might be uh, a nightjar that migrates, but one does not know where it migrates to. Um, and it's, it's just steeped in mystery. And I, I do plan to go back there. I have tried to get in there once before, but I, I got shot at, so I had to turn back. But sure. it's a place that warrants further study because it's just rich in biodiversity. And I hope to go back there and, and look at everything from the butterflies and frogs to, to uh, the small mammals and of course the birds. Absolutely, and what a privilege to be able to access such a, a wild space. I, I'm sure there are not many of those very, very isolated and difficult to get to places nowadays. So uh, you really are lucky to have been out to some way so remote, Vernon. Absolutely. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through at the moment. I wonder, Vernon, from my side, um, I've spent a very, very brief uh, period in Ethiopia, north of Addis, out in the, the high altitude wetlands. But how long yes. was your trip to literally go from Addis down to the, the plains and back? How many days did it take you to move through that vast landscape? It, it was about a week. Um, but we drove, you, you know, I mean, w ideally what one would do um, is drive from Addis very slowly down the Rift Valley and spend weeks looking at all the biodiversity en route. And, and I've done that many times, but because we had this map with this X that marked the spot and we had to get from A to B very quickly, we drove through the night from Addis and that was a, a, a one, almost two day trip and then spent the rest of the time in Nechisar and then drove back. And then 
after all of that, spent a, a long time in Ethiopia getting to know the place a bit better. But uh, uh, yeah, that, that was the extent of it. It was a, a wonderful self-funded uh, adventure um, that uh, has changed my life. Uh, absolutely, no doubt. And I, I agree with you, Ethiopia is a, an incredible country to visit. I mean, they've got, I think, over 80 different tribes within the country, and each one of them brings their own unique flavor and style to the absolutely. world. Absolutely. So, it's a, a wonderful, it's a special wonderful place. place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the biodiversity is just off this, it's, out of this world. It's, it's amazing. Something else. Mm. Definitely. I see Mark's got another question for you, Vernon. <laughs> As someone who likes to chase these rare birds, uh, if you are determined to see one species in your lifetime besides the, the Nechasar nightjar, what species would that be? Well, tomorrow morning, I hope it's going to be the hardy dar ibis. <laughs> <laughs> but That's if I had to, if I had to dream of of the next really rare species of bird that uh, I, I, I might want to see, it would be the Congo, the Congo peacock, the punk, male or female. Uh, just to see a Congo peafowl in the wild would be something very special because it would mean that I would need to be in a very special part of that rainforest. And there's stuff there that is still new to science. There's still stories to be told. And um, if you do read, uh, if you do read Featherings, uh, everybody out there, read Canon Cohen's account of his sighting of the Congo peacock. It's really a lovely story. Absolutely, and and what a special bird to see. I agree with you. That I think that's something that's so incredible about certain species of birds. You just know when you connect with them, you happen to be somewhere that is so remote and so special and particular to that specific species it, it really does give you quite a thrill and it's one of the things i've personally always loved about birding is the remote places that birds have taken me to that nobody would ever go to unless they were looking for for birds and it's just a, a wonderful hobby to to be able to adventure in that way and you know melissa i mentioned a bird watchers and their love of maps um i, I you know if, if you had to ask bird watchers in south africa about this country you'd be amazed at how well-traveled they are. They've been to all parts of the country because that's where the birds are. They get you to places you've never been to before. Um, and, and bird watching tends to do that. Um, but always, while you are looking at those birds in those remote places, remember about the one outside your window in your garden and how important that is. Absolutely. And I think what's so special, Vernon, is if we look at the world and how birds have been able to radiate into every kind of habitat from those absolutely frozen Arctic and Antarctic habitats where no human could ever survive without massive intervention and engineering to the absolutely boiling deserts of the Sahara and the Kalahari and everything in between. There is no place on earth where you can go where you will not find a bird nearby. And I think that's just such an, an incredibly special thing about this taxa. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I and I see we've got a nice, yeah. yeah, we've got a nice comment here from Ray Shaw saying that he thinks birding is just another extension of an architect's ability to notice detail. And I think you do that so beautifully <laughs> in the way that you, you're able to take what you see and really describe it in such a, a stunning way and really enjoyable way to, to read all of your accounts of your amazing adventures. So thank you for, well, it's for just, sharing it's that. an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> and, uh, I see we've got a, a question here from uh, one of my colleagues, Reason, who's also made a, an appearance here on, on Conservation Conversations um, earlier on in the year. And, um, Reason saying, thank you so much for your inspirational talk. You mentioned about the walls that rivers can present as um, dividing the free movement of wildlife and cultures. Do you have any advice to give young generations in terms of how we deal with these um, sort of physical environmental walls that are, are ahead of us? Yeah, it's a very good question, Reason, and it's, 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 it's actually directly why I wrote my latest book, because it's all about walls and, and, and trying to break them down and how poisonous they are. But, you know, if you look across Africa and you look at the countries that make up Africa, and many of them have these straight lines that seem to have been drawn by rulers, um, and then other edges of countries are these winding things that are the the, uh, the banks of rivers, the Congo River is one of them. It reminds me of the sort of arbitrariness of these, these sovereignties created by uh, and imposed on Africa um, that are in many ways fake walls. Because, you know, when I was on the Congo River, um, I might be on the one bank with a community and they would have half their 
homes on the one side of the Congo River and the, the other homes on the other side and they had fish in between. They didn't see it as a, as, a, as a sovereign boundary. They just saw it as a river, a place for their boats. And that's what rivers should be. They shouldn't be boundaries. There should be great linking things, linking people, linking cultures, linking us across Africa. And uh, I'm a big one for the destruction of all kinds of walls, sovereign walls, walls between neighbors, walls between cultures and religions, walls between languages, all kinds of walls need to be gone. Absolutely, what a powerful sentiment. And I suppose one uh, prolific pusher of the wall theory has just fallen. So happy yes. days for that. <laughs> Indeed, indeed, so, but let's not we're, go we're there. We're not going to yes. go there. <laughs> I'll put my political bias aside. But uh, <laughs> I agree with you, Vernon, and, and it's so beautiful. I mean, if we think of water as the ultimate life giver, I agree with you. Those rivers should be bridges, not barriers. Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. It's, I think that's a wonderful sentiment that you've shared with us tonight. So thank you for that. I, I, I can just share with you what Martin, Martin Heidegger once said, the great philosopher. Yes. He said, boundary is the beginning of presencing. And what he meant was, when you draw a line in the sand, it's not a wall. It's just a place to locate yourself so that you can step over it. That's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you, Vernon. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. Otherwise, we'll get, we'll get <laughs> off topic. More philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a, a very important question. We've been talking a lot about these amazing books that you've written, Vernon. Um, and Shirley's asked, where can people actually buy your books from? What's the easiest way for them to support the Fitzpatrick Institute as well as yourself? And uh, how do they get hold well, of your books? Okay, well, BirdLife South Africa's um, uh, shop has got all my books. So you can buy all of the books at BirdLife South Africa's uh, shop. Um, and then you can get them in exclusive books and all the bookshops everywhere. And you can order them online and you can get them from uh, my publishers, Jakarta Media. They're in ebook and they're in uh, hard copy. They're all in hardback. Um, and uh, you can even get them in other languages and they're all over the world. And please go buy lots of the books because the more you buy, the more money I get so I can go bird watching. <laughs> and write more exciting stories. And my, write more books. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Vernon. Yes. And if anybody is looking to, to buy through Bird Life South Africa, just drop uh, Shireen Gould. At, she's available on membership at birdlife.org.za. She'll be able to help you with getting access to our shop. Um, speaking of Bird Life South Africa, Vernon, would you like to share with us just how you got involved with Bird Life South Africa and where your sort of journey with our organization has come from yes. and where it currently I, is at, please? Yes, I would love to. I would love to do that. It probably would require an entire uh, co uh, conservation conservations presentation, <laughs> but I'll do it in two minutes, or in one minute. I mean, I've been on the board of Bird Life South Africa for about 20 years, um, but I came to Bird Life South Africa by joining a wonderful bird club called the Cape Bird Club, uh, because I wanted to watch birds and I wanted other people to help me learn about the birds in my local area. And then I ended up as chairman of the Cape Bird Club and then chairman of the Western Cape Birding Forum. And then finally, I was on the board of bird life and ended up as chairman and have just been so privileged to watch this organization grow into one of the finest conservation NGOs, certainly in South Africa, if not in Africa, under the stewardship of, of a man like Mark Anderson and his team and people like you, Melissa, who inspire me every day and make me want to be, you know, to commit all my time to looking after birds and looking at birds and writing about birds, but I, I can't spend all my time doing that. But I, I regard bird life as my second home. It's my family and I love you all so much and I'm very grateful to be part of it. Thank you, Vernon, and we really do appreciate all of your many, many, many years of service to our organization. We really do value the, the wonderful friendship, and I agree with you, family bonds that have been built between yourself and our organization, and thank you for all thank you, you do, and thank you for thank your you. kind words. Um, we've got a good question here from Halebua, and he's asking, as a, a developing bird watcher, what advice would you give in terms of the five top bird books they should probably look at getting to kick off their birding career? Aha, uh -huh, Khaliboa. Um, is that Khaliboa, my friend, who sits on the board of BirdLife South Africa? It could very well be, yes. Ah, I think okay. it might be. Okay. <laughs> well, Khaliboa, first of all, the first four books you've got to buy and keep on your bird book list are mine. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, get a field guide. Get a field guide for the birds of uh, your local area. 
preferably the Birds of South Africa, the Cecil Field Guide, the Newman's Guide. Uh, there are a number of fantastic field guides, the Birds of South or Southern Africa, um, and, uh, and, 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 and meet other bird watchers and learn bird watching with other people. If you go bird watching, join a local bird club, learn the birds in your area with other people. I mean, one of the things bird watching has given me, one of the greatest gifts is the friends I've made. The friends I've made watching birds. There's nothing more exciting for me than sharing, looking at a bird with someone else. And bird watching gives you that. It gives you that opportunity to share this wonderful world of looking at birds with others. So join a bird club, join Bird Life South Africa and learn with others. We never stop learning, all of us. So it's a constant sharing. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more with that, Ben, and the, the bonds and friendships that I've made through my bird watching hobbies and my career in conservation of birds is, their bonds I'll never ever leave or lose because they really yes, are quality absolutely. people. People who are absolutely. enlightened and inspired to appreciate the natural world around them are absolutely. a very, very special group of people and we're lucky to have them out there. Um, we've got a, a comment really from Eileen and I think this very much speaks to what you said about your hardy dars and your olive thrushes. Um, and she's saying, since working from home and with summer starting to arrive, the bird she's enjoyed hearing at all times of day and night is the pit mayfro. You know, these are summer migrants coming back in from Central Africa. So red-chested cuckoo, for those of you who don't know the Afrikaans name. Um, she says, today she had awesome views of him or her sitting out in the open frantically calling. And that's the pleasure that she derives, not having to go out and chase these rare birds, but enjoying the everyday ones who surround us all the time. And I think you really highlighted that with your hardy dark comment. I've got a pair of hardy dars nesting in the tree above my roof. And despite wanting to murder them at four in the morning when those vuvuzelas sound, it's always good to know that they are there. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Absolutely. Now we've got an anonymous question here, um, asking what advice you'd give to future generations regarding bird watching and that intimate connection that there is between us as humans and the natural world. And how do we inspire people to take advantage of that connection and be inspired to pursue the preservation of birds in the natural world? My, my, my great hope is that, um, that, that we can reach out to the youth of our country and the youth across Africa uh, so that they can begin to see nature um, in, in the way that will allow them to shape their lives and, and, and in the way that will allow them to see their fellow human beings as an interconnected community. Um, and, and nature and bird watching teaches you about interconnectedness. And the day that we can share bird watching across all the communities in South Africa, from the townships to the leafy suburbs, where, where, where the bird clubs are a mixture of all kinds of people, is gonna be a wonderful day. And, and that's where we have to head. And if we can get there, our environment will be saved and so will we. Absolutely awesome words, Vernon, and I echo those sentiments 100%. Our strength lies in diversity and long may that reign in this country. I think yes. we have reached the end of all of our questions, Vernon. I would like to say a massive, massive thank you to you for coming on tonight and sharing that absolutely inspirational talk with all of us in such a beautiful way. You really are gifted with your words and we look forward to your many, many books that are still to come and hopefully many more birding adventures that you will share with us and the birding world. So Vernon, I'll, I'll give you the floor now if you'd like to say anything more before we close, yes. but a big thank I, you yes. from me. <laughs> Well, Melissa, um, yes, I'll just be very brief and I just want to thank everybody for um, listening and watching this evening. Um, I really love sharing my love of birds and bird watching. And I want to thank you for you and Andrew de Bloc for, uh, and your team for putting this, this, this series of, 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 um, of webinars together that has really given Bird Life South Africa such a fantastic platform. Um, across South Africa and across Africa and across the world. And I, I know it's going to grow and grow and grow. And uh, if there's anything I can do to help grow it even further, um, I'm there to help. But congratulations. It's so professional, so well done. You've held my hand. As you can see, I press all the wrong buttons. I'm not good at this sort of thing, but uh, we managed. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much, Ben, and, and uh, we really do appreciate yours and everyone else's support. This uh, 
was a, a chance idea as we went into lockdown. And I think it's been a lot of fun over the last couple of weeks and months. And as you say, long may it last. And we look forward to welcoming everybody back in 2021. But we have two more webinars to go this year. And we are looking forward to both of them. So from me, everyone, keep your eyes on the skies. Keep enjoying those birds and happy birding. I will see you all next week, same time, same place, Tuesdays at 7 o'clock South African time. Look after yourselves. Stay safe. Wear a mask. And I will see you all next week. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.